everyone. Thanks for showing up for the session. Really excited about it. I think it's a super interesting topic and also really star-studded um, panel today. Um, you know, in terms of value add, I think it's, it's been a topic for a while. It's becoming more and more important as, you know, venture capital is becoming commoditized. Um, it's really hard, you know, you need to fight your way into the best rounds, but you also want to think about how can you provide your founders anything that gives them the best chance of winning and then also returning, obviously, um, to your fund. Um, so before we dig a bit deeper, I would love to ask you guys to just maybe introduce yourself, give a bit of background, and then also on your fund, how you guys really think about value add and how you, you know, stick out, why founders work with you. Yeah. So I'm Marlene Holmberg. I work for Target Global. Um, my background is more operational. I used to be a CEO of a telco company before in different countries around Europe uh, and joined Target a year and a half ago. Um, Target Global, I think maybe you know, but it's a, it's a large VC fund uh, across European, uh, UK, Tel Aviv, uh, Berlin offices. Um, yeah, and how we think about adding value, I guess we'll talk more about later, but we think about um, there's a lot of value, I think, that a VC can add to, to um, uh, startups. Um, and we'll talk about the relationship, I think, between the investor and the, and the founder, because I think that's a key point on how much value you actually can add. Uh, that has to be right. Um, but we look at everything from strategic value to M&A value um, to uh, operational value for scale up, your processes, hiring, and relationships, quite a lot around uh, relationships. Jalen? Yeah, I founded La Familia, um, or co-founded La Familia actually two and a half years ago. And we focus on any B2B technologies that either disrupt or enable large sector industries. And the way this happened was that I actually come from a traditional German family business background myself and quickly realized that there was such a gap um, in between both worlds and that they really needed to be like a smart access platform that would be connecting both, um, both worlds in a, in, a, in a mutually beneficial way. Um, so we actually brought in a lot of traditional family businesses as, as our LPs from various sectors um, next to, you know, like successful founders from the digital industry that we very much use as, um, as a booster and as a, as a go-to-market enhancement for our portfolio companies. So our concept is very simple in that we provide a lot of value add by um, connecting our founders early on to potential POCs, pilot projects, really help them go to market faster and avoid these tenacious sales cycles of up to 18 months um, down to several weeks and therefore just kind of you know help them leapfrog competition somewhat. Yeah, that's us. Thanks. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ophelia. I'm the founder of a fund called Blossom Capital. Um, you probably haven't heard of us because we only launched uh, this year, but my partners and I have been either investing or operating uh, in tech businesses for, I guess, the longest of us now, two decades. Um, so Blossom's pitch is that uh, we, you know, we'd say we bring high conviction investing to Europe. Um, what that means is that we look to lead rounds at seed and Series A, predominantly Series A. And when we invest, we throw the full weight of it behind us. So uh, when we talk about kind of being a, uh, bringing value add to the table, that was kind of one of the first um, values and principles in which we set out and how we wanted to differentiate, which doesn't only mean leading round, it means having an experienced team of both operators and investors, um, and all of us work with every single investment. So we don't believe in one partner for one company because we have such diverse experience between us crossing engineering, products, sales, operations, and strategy um, that our company should benefit from all of that. So we only make a small number of investments each year, four to five, so you, you really do get the bandwidth from us. Um, and I'm sure we'll dig into more detail later, but that's us. Hi, my name's Vidisha. I'm the founder of Signals Venture Capital. So we launched a fund in 2017. Um, it's a 100 million euro fund. We typically invest between one and five million euros in early stage businesses all across Europe um, with a focus on enterprise and B2B. When we launched in 2017, I think there were 14 other funds launched roughly at the same time in that year. And so we thought a lot about what kind of value could we add because launching a fund is very much like launching a product in a market. You need to find what is your differentiation um, and how can you attract great entrepreneurs to, to receive capital from you. Um, and so we actually went out and we did, a, we did a survey. This was one of the first things we did and we asked entrepreneurs what, what matters to you. And we found out that um, 
different things mattered at different stages of, of building a company, but really at the early stage, the things that mattered were things like go-to-market, hiring was crucial, um, and we focused a lot of our en energies and we built or we tried to build features of our fund that would um, tailor to the entrepreneurs that we were backing. And maybe like a follow-up question on that, because both of you mentioned that the funds are quite young, right? So it was an active sort of thought process of setting up that value add piece. How important was that for you guys to really also align the value add with the investment stage, the type of you know the type of companies you want to back, the industry maybe? Is there something that you guys found was you know really important here? It was really important, and I think a lot of that is also around who your LPs are and where you're getting the money for your, for your fund. So um, I should caveat the fact that Signals Venture Capital, our LP is Signal Iduna. It's one of Germany's largest um, healthcare insurance companies. And the thing is, we, when we launched the fund, we really wanted to make sure that we didn't um, give it the whole CVC angle to the fund so that it wouldn't just be a corporate vehicle um, investing in early stage founders. And, we try to align the value that an organization as large as Signali Duna can provide with the really creative founders that we're backing. And um, the first investment we did was actually an automation hero. They've raised their Series A from Atomico. They just raised 14 and a half million from them. And um, we really wanted to be on that principle of aligning what is the value that our LP has with the entrepreneurs that we're backing. Right, got it. And you know, maybe you want to go, go first and then we can dig deeper into sort of the IP base as well. Yeah, I think um, so all of us kind of being founders ourselves, um, I guess you know, founding a VC fund is slightly different from a company, but we go through the same journey. Um, I think we understand a lot of what entrepreneurs need um, and then having invested in you know, multiple Series A companies across the years and or even operated in businesses that have gone to raise money from investors, some stories good, some stories bad, I think the beauty of starting with the clean slate is you, you get to pick the best of what you've seen and avoid the worst. Um, and so we realized that um, you know, combining our experience, and I would say that a lot of our experience actually comes from California and having witnessed what actually hyper growth means, but under having the cultural understanding and the networks in Europe, there was a lot that we could do quite differently to traditional European VCs. Um, and so we really mapped out kind of the core areas where we think founders need help. And a lot of that is, as Pradesh said, it's kind of with hiring, it's with strategy, it's customer introductions or potential customer introductions, um, kind of having that overview of kind of how startups scale um, and then figuring out how best to work with them. And that was one of the principles in which we built our partnership is, you know, one of my partners led a uh, product to Facebook for five years then went on to be CTO of a well-known uh, company in Europe called Deliveroo. One of my partners is a data scientist and quant engineer. And another one of my partners uh, built out Klarna's technical sales team across Germany and the rest of Europe. So really kind of varied operational experience, but actually it means we can touch on multiple points. And that was kind of the ambition from when we start is really how do we roll up our sleeves and help our teams. Right, great. And sort of thinking maybe, Marlon, you can add to this point as well. Um, you've obviously have a big portfolio by now have seen some of the founders go through from the early stage really you know, to large scale. How have you seen sort of the value add or the help and support the founders need evolve with the stage of the company? Um, does it change or is it just a different type of help or maybe sort of does the level of support um, app out? as the companies progress? Sure, I mean, there, I think there's some similarities. I mean, we, we have both early stage and growth stage funds. So we go from seed to CD. Um, but I think if you look at the early stage and, and the growth, some similarities, you know, they, they can be uh, adding value in terms of uh, helping with customer and networks and, and things like this, go to market strategies, all of this. But when you come to a certain size, I think uh, it come, becomes more around structure. So how do you make the leap from being a company with 100 employees to 1,000 employees? So it's, there's a different leadership challenge there. How do you reach out to 1,000 people in multi-location compared to maybe 100 that you can speak to directly on the floor? Um, so, so that's a different stage. And the same thing with maybe processes. Um, they also have to scale across uh, a different spectrum. How do you, how do you, you know, build those processes so that they can actually scale with you? Because if you have a very successful business, you're going to scale fast. Then don't, don't go too, too, too low in your ambition of the setup of processes and operations. Maybe aim really high. Um, and I think a third one is probably around the, the HR aspect with the team. 
uh, some parts of the team in the early stages might not, might not be right for the team and for the company in the, in the later stages. And that's a very difficult thing uh, to manage yeah. as well. So yeah, some, some similarities, but also some differences across. And sort of in a different funds, so you guys have different models then of helping the companies? Sort of, you know, is it always the partners really lead on ideas and they, as Ophelia mentioned as well, they just need to make sure that they can spend enough time? Or is there sort of a platform team, different stages focus? Um, yeah. No, we have also, uh, like was mentioned here, you know, team with different backgrounds and experiences. So there's a lead partner who's responsible for that. But as the portfolio grows, of course, that partner cannot be as actively involved across all the companies. But then we have partners who are really good at business development and have that network on the biz dev side. We have more operational, like my background is more operational partner. Um, and then we have people with very different experiences across uh, and they do different things than with the company. And I think the other thing is to, um, the team as it grows, you need to be able to actually scale yourself. So if we invest in companies that are scaling and we also as a VC have to be able to properly scale. Yeah. And there it's about letting go as well a little bit from a partnership perspective, You're used to being very active in every deal, then you have to step up and make sure you can manage through, through the team. Right, thank you. And Jeanette, sort of we discussed a little bit of you know IP base and how much value that can be actually. You guys have quite an interesting setup in terms of IP base. Do you want to give us a bit more background on you know how you make most use of it, how your founders get access to all these industries essentially, and how it helps them? Sure, happy to. So I think what's interesting is that um, a lot of these LP base, uh, the LP base actually covers like a very broad range of industries from insurance to um, the process industry, industrial manufacturing, retail, et cetera, et cetera. And what's interesting is that uh, that ad obviously comes with a high degree of sector expertise and, 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 and market understanding, which we first of all use in our diligence as we look at a lot of vertical SaaS plays um, across these, these industry verticals. Um, so that actually helps us kind of get a, get a quicker grip in our diligence. And then post an investment, what usually happens quite fast is that that, that kind of, you know, they, they, really, um, they really start engaging in pilot projects and they really start sort of um, leapfrogging these companies into actual customer traction, which then obviously helps them in their, in their, in their, in their Series A fundraisers because what's usually visible at seed stage is if you have a great team and a strong product and a strong technology, um, what kind of Series A investors then look for is just seeing that momentum and, and that kind of revenue um, traction unfold. And so this is really something that I think these LPs have been incredibly helpful with. What's also interesting is that I think it's hard to kind of understand both mindsets. You have an a, a established industry player that has everything to lose and you have startups that have everything to gain with really smart people behind them. Um, I think what's interesting is that you need to read both mindsets and then that is a trigger and a key to get to product market fit early in time. Um, and product market fit, I really think what, what all most you know, post seed stage companies are really looking for, at least early signs of it. Um, and this is also something that I think comes with our team to a degree that is um, very helpful um, across these, you know, first 18 months of their of their of the company's evolution. Because my partner Judith is from is from uh, Facebook originally, has a data science and machine learning background. Um, I come more from sort of later stage private equity in the different um, in, in different industry verticals. So I think both these angles together just um, help us um, get that sensitivity going and help our portfolio companies really. Um, optimize their product to what we call like a humanized rationality angle where we very much believe that technology alone, um, you know, if you throw it in an industry, it won't work, but you actually need to have a sensitivity for workflows and have a sensitivity for, for the other counterpart to, to get to, um, to get a product market fit. Right. Um, there's actually two things that I want to, you know, go a bit deeper on. The first one would be um, sort of how much do your LPs themselves actually care about getting involved and how much do they also care about your vision for value add when in, you know, backing your fund essentially? Um, Very much so. so I think f they're all realizing that they're just in this kind of <laughs> disruptive, this disruptive force is hitting them, right? So I think they're all looking for enabling technologies and they want to have visibility on stuff that could, you know, hit them, hit them uh, more and more frontal. So this is something that um, they very much value in the exchange with us is getting that kind of early radar system going and also understanding a little bit what what will drive their businesses in five to ten years from now. So they are actually very receptive, which makes us like a great collaboration and great um, great exchange. Great. And do you want to add? Sorry. Um, and sort of all of you mentioned also a bit of sort of operational background on your own backgrounds. Um, you know, how 
supportive? How helpful is that really for the founders? Do you, do you feel this makes you a good investor, essentially, um, that you have that background? Or do you think um, you know, being a financial investor is basically your core strength, and then you just open a network to operators? So I think that, that it's two very different skill sets, right? So the ability to write a book and the ability to review a book are two very <laughs> different skill sets. Um, but as, a, as an investor, one of the things that some kind of operational um, experience can give you is obviously, we, we talk about it a lot in our industry, pattern recognition. Basically the ability to say, okay, I've seen this work before and I haven't seen something else work. Um, and then you share that wisdom with, with founders. And the longer that you've been in that game and the longer that you've spent working with a multitude of, of um, companies, the more expertise that you can provide on, on that. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you, oh, sorry, I think if you look at it from an operational perspective or a financial perspective, uh, I think it's very helpful to, you know, to have a financial investor looking at deals and coming up with it, this is the deal we should do. But it's also helpful to then have an operational eye looking at that business and saying, what will be the key points, you think, in this that will be challenges during the journey so that you can see if you're the right person to prepare and help uh, the company during that journey. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think, uh, to Vidisha's point, they are very different skill sets. And so when we were setting up our partnership precisely for that reason, we decided we wanted people with different experience and different networks. I think, you know, operational, I'm the only inv pure investor on our team. Um, and I think the operational value add is very, very clear. Like, I'm not going to be on the one and advising how to build your infrastructure, your tech stack, um, how to make that first kind of engineering hire. But what I can advise on is fundraising, and that's obviously kind of the core competency that the business needs. Um, and our view is that, you know, we do the Series A and actually the best next round should be from a US or West Coast growth fund. Um, if you map out the companies that have gone on to be successful in Europe, you know, 90% of those bring in the likes of Sequoia, Kleiner, Greylock, et cetera. And so we make it a part of our duty to make sure that we're working with our companies to get them that best next investor in. And I think that's part of an investor strength as well. Yeah, and a lot of the, the value that a VC fund has is not only internal, right? It's a lot of it is also external. So the networks that you've built over that period of time. And um, that's also why brand is so important in VC, yeah. right? Because most of the investments that we make, they follow a power law. It's very few investments that actually return all, all, most of the money in these funds. And companies and funds that have been around a lot longer, they have richer, deeper networks. And as newbies in, in this space or a new fund in this space, you, we need to be clever and intelligent about the way that we can forge these networks for the entrepreneurs that we're investing in. And how did you guys go about communicating that value out as well? As you said, you're a new fund in, in the market. There's a lot of competition. It's, you know, how did you really go about that? Well, I'm a little bit of an an anomaly in the Berlin space because I've only been investing in enterprise. Um, in Germany and, and a lot of investors in Berlin have been doing a lot of consumer stuff and are now just moving in enterprise. So that was one of the, the key things that was um, crucial for the entrepreneurs that I was investing in. But also um, it was around, we created features and products for our funds. So one of the products we created was Shortcut. It's um, essentially thinking about the biggest problem for an enterprise um, company right at the beginning is how do I get my first customer? How do I get my first couple of customers? And one way to navigate that is to work with your LP base. So I said Signali Duna earlier. Um, but another way to do it, and this is very common in the US, is to have something called a corporate briefing center, where you bring C-level people into a room who are real decision makers, and they get to meet with early stage companies that are solving problems for them. And we started doing this with um, our first couple of investments. And like Ophelia said earlier, they don't make many investments a year. We don't make many investments a year. We only make three to five investments a year. So we can really spend time with our portfolio. And people felt that when we were doing the deals, they felt that we had time for them. We could pick up the phone. We, at any time, we were available. And I think that makes a lot of difference. Great. Nice. And then maybe for all of you, um, starting with you, Martin. How do you guys, because we were talking about the real value add, and as an investor, we always want to you know, measure results also based on actual you know, numbers, probably. But how do you guys really measure the impact of your value add? Is it, in the end, how well the portfolio is doing? Are you asking your founders? Is it based on referrals? 
Um, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's uh, it's uh, about the performance of the uh, assets. Uh, that's uh, for sure it is. But but it's also you know it's uh, it's very hard to it's very competitive out there. So it's not only for early for new sort of newer funds to differentiate. It's also we haven't been around for that long, but we've been around for six seven years. Where but it's, you still have to really market yourself and 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 sell yourself. I think to the founders. Uh, and uh, the way, the best way to, to get founders to, to be interested in talking to you is if other founders uh, recommend you, right? That is really uh, the key thing. So I think you can really measure your own value add if the founder comes to you yeah. and asks for advice and wants to be, you know, to be a sounding board and to have discussions, uh, and if they're willing to recommend you to others. I think financial returns and that is the, the, most, uh, the two most uh, important things. Thanks. Jeanette? I think it's uh, what you're saying is absolutely right. I think you have to be, I think in order to go back to the brand discussion maybe quickly, I think brand comes with, and comes with authenticity to begin with. I think you have to be authentic about what you can deliver and then you just gotta be acing it, right? You just gotta be really make sure you nail your value proposition over and over again and make founders feel like you're really, you know, delivering on your promise. Um, and then, as you said, that's really kind of just creates this spin of them referring you and their peers. And then typically these peers are clustered in the same network. So that just creates a very strong bottom up deal flow early on. Um, and then I think I just very much believe in, in syndicating rounds also, right? I think it makes sense to um, bring in different viewpoints, different skill sets from, from other funds, other co investors, and into rounds just to make sure that those companies get the best of everything. Yeah, I think um, we were fortunate enough. We're a new fund, but we've been doing this, as I said, for a long, long time. So I think people kind of know us in the market already. And now when we're trying to convince founders to work with us, I always say to us, you know, speak to any single one of the founders we've ever worked with. And I'm not going to make the introduction. You can literally ask who to speak to. And hopefully you'll realize that everything we're saying is true. Um, and that's the strongest reference you can have for a fund, I think. Great. And I think you also mentioned something about differences between obviously the US market and the European market. How is that for value add? What do founders tell you? What do you see yourself in a market? How do we need to maybe get better or does the US need to learn from us? So I think it's really interesting when you look at the evolution of, of VC funds here in, here in Europe. Um, so when Andreessen started the whole platform play, we saw that emerging here in Europe as well. Um, there are a lot of things to learn from the US market just because of the sheer number of funds that are there. The more funds you have, the more competition you have, and therefore then the more differentiation you need to create. And I think we're only right now seeing that competitive em um, energy emerging in, in, in Europe where funds are seriously thinking about, oh, I can't just have my brand be testament to um, what, what value I provide. Oh, yes, we've, we've worked with founders, a lot of us have worked with founders over the years, but um, again, that word of mouth referral no longer is, is strong enough. So I think we need to, in the coming years, think stronger and harder about how can we differentiate even further. You know, things right now in the US, there's a lot of content, podcasts, <laughs> um, blog posts, that's also here in Europe. So I think it's gonna become a very noisy space as people try and differentiate. Yeah, I think to, to add to that, I think there's one thing that you can add value in, in Europe that is not needed in the US, and that's the different countries here. So, you know, I think a European investor can add value by understanding the regulatory differences across the spectrum, um, being able to be on the ground in the local market to, to connect to the right people there, and understanding the sort of consumer differences and even corporate differences that there are in Europe. And that's, you know, it's a, it's a good thing, but a tough thing as well. Yeah. The good thing is that you know, once companies get in there, it's harder for other companies to do that. Um, but it is hard to, to get it started. Yeah, yeah, on that point, I just yeah. wanted to, that, that made me smile, Malin, because I just saw that Insight Ventures, which is a US-based fund, just launched a how to go to market in Europe re research report. So I had to, <laughs> had to laugh about that. Nice. Do you guys want to add something as well as that? Maybe Ophelia, because you mentioned a lot about the US and how you guys help companies bridge into the market. Yeah, look, I think go to market in the US is extremely important for European companies. And I think 
where we kind of see the difference of you know, being here five years ago or even 10 years ago, entrepreneurs used to move to the Valley figuring that's the only place that they could A, find talent and B, get funding. Um, and that's now changed because I think there's great European talent. Founders are wanting to build at home where they have an advantage to be able to source and hire through their network. And they're saying, okay, but obviously we still want to sell into the US. Um, and that's a lot of what we help with, is figuring out how to build your product and engineering team and figure out how to sell both kind of East Coast and West Coast. And I think that the things that we all brought from our time in California, you know, I was fortunate enough to see the company called Robin Hood, which was you know, six people at the time back in 2013, is now you know, north of five billion and millions of customers and seen that kind of hyper growth. And obviously my, my partner is seeing the same at Facebook, is we know real ambition and we know hyper growth um, and we're not scared. And I think that, a lot of European VCs have been burned badly early 2000s, post 08, come at it quite risk averse. Whereas we come out of it being like, okay, let's build the solid foundations, but how fast can you accelerate growth and kind of how big can we make this? And are you looking for that when you choose the founder already, sort of that mindset? Or is it also about you pushing the founders into a direction a little bit? No, we never push. It's right. always about finding a team that want to go fast. And then what we see ourselves as an enabler, it's like, have you thought about it this way? Or we could do it like this. Um, you know, our job is to kind of be solution oriented and kind of figure out how we can make that happen. I'd actually add to that point by saying that I've spoken to VCs over the years that think that value add is just a whole bunch of rubbish <laughs> that VCs have made up um, because they believe that the best founders, the ones that have this ambition, the ones that build great companies, they do it anyway, regardless of who's invested in them. So that's just a counterpoint to some of the, some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah. How, how do you guys think about that then? No, I think, I mean, we would also never invest in someone who doesn't have the big ambition in, in, you know, in the first place. You cannot give someone that big ambition. They have to come with that ambition. I think many people can, of course, anyone in life can succeed alone if they're really, really good, right? With a team and, and to drive. But if you can make it better by, by finding a sort of a complementary VC that can maybe bring the things that you are not that's not the strongest thing you have. You can maybe make it faster and, and, and better, but you might not necessarily need the VC, of course. Right, and sort of maybe just a really short follow up because we're wrapping up soon. Um, how often do you guys find founders actually optimizing for the value add rather than sort of price or speed of execution on the round? Um, yeah. Sorry. I think it's actually quite um, common that like best founders just optimize for the most value add VCs, um, and then these rounds just get really competitive. Um, so I think it's really important. And then what usually happens is that they, you know, call other founders for reference on you, yeah. and then just make sure that you actually are real. Um, so I think it is getting increasingly, increasingly competitive from that point of view. But I think also, I really, as I said before, syndication is important, and also maybe bringing in U.S. angel investors into companies that eventually want to scale to the U.S. simply because they, you know, often have that deeper visibility on, on technological development in, 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 in certain sectors um, that is very valuable or can provide valuable market entry points. So we have a lot of people from Y Combinator involved in our advisor network that we actively co-invest with and that come into our seed rounds. Um, and that really helps a lot with, with exactly what Ophelia was mentioning. I think it also depends if you ask a first time founder or right. a repeat founder. Um, so in our portfolio, we have quite a few repeat founders. Um, I mentioned Automation Hero. This is Stefan's third company. His previous company was Datamir. It was backed by Kleiner and Sequoia. We also are investor in Cirque. You probably see the e-scooters around. That's from Lukas Gadowski, the former founder of um, Delivery Hero. So I think from the ones that have been through the journey before, um, they're a lot more skeptical about what value add really is. Um, and they ask a lot more pressing questions before they choose um, which capital they're going to take. The first time founders, um, I think as Jeanette said, they, they um, go for the ones that they... Uh, right. Yep. And maybe to end up the session really quick from all of you, put yourself in the shoe of a founder and you're working with a fund and the value is just not coming through as you expected, just not getting the help that you were hoping for. Any strategies on you know making sure you get that and really raise that issue? I think I think the first thing you should try and do is to make sure you 
take money from the right partner in the first place um, because things go up and down in the life cycle. You know, uh, sometimes there's good times, sometimes there's bad times. And if you're not in aligned with the partner you have, it's kind of tricky during that time to get alignment. It's like a marriage. It's like yeah. a marriage. I mean, you know, yeah. friction for starts and then it gets really tough. And, uh, and the going usually gets some tough in startups during some time. So that's the first thing. Um, yeah, and the second thing I think is just um, work quite openly uh, with the VCs that you have uh, and be quite clear about your, your, you know, your long-term plan, your strategic direction so that you have create alignment around that. Because of course the VCs have their investors behind them that they have explained what they're doing to. So uh, they also need to be able to, to discuss that. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, to your point, like, make sure you take references before you uh, choose who you're going to partner with. Um, and I think my overarching kind of recommendation is don't forget that you're the customer. It's not the VC, it's you. Um, and so if things aren't working, just sit down and talk about it and ask for the help that you actually need. I also think timing is really important. So if you need help, don't wait until really, until it's the last, last minute. Things like hiring takes a long time. Um, all of the things that we've been discussing today, that value, it takes time to, to really be finalized. And so a lot of our work with founders is building that trust relationship that they can open up to us and they can tell us the things that go good. So you get a lot of good phone calls when people, when things are going well and then it goes radio <laughs> silence when things aren't going so well. So um, yeah, we just wanna build those really good relationships with founders so that they can open up to us. Great, thank you. Should I closing comment? Yeah, I think that uh, everything <laughs> has been said. I think it's different for different stages, right? I think especially at Seed, it's a lot of handholding and it's a lot of, um, it, it just requires a lot of empathy when it comes to also building out the you know, culture of a firm initially, which I think is, is very important. Um, and what we're seeing with the best founders usually is that they're the ones that you know, need the least help, <laughs> interestingly enough, but they, when they come to you, it's always with very, very punchy and very precise questions. And then what I think needs to happen fast is that you, um, you know, if you can't, if you don't think you can, you're the right person to answer this, and just make sure you have the right person at hand very quickly, and um, that maybe can share first and experience, in around around different topics. Yeah. Great, thank you all so much. I think there would have been many more things that we could have discussed, but um, yeah, running out of time. Thank you as well for listening. I hope that was useful. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>